The truth will set you free. Amen. Smile on. Jesus loves you. Right. Hallelujah. Truth will set you free. My hope provides me with a spur. Man, we are looking at the life of Joseph. We're looking at his brothers. He's got uh, 11 brothers, 10 that have with him, one that was left back at home. And, and Joseph's attitude throughout this whole thing. Man, you can see the, the truth of this song. My hope provides me with the spur. Well, God was using a lot of spurs in Joseph's life. Man, his brothers were a spur. Going to being sold into slavery was a spur. Being bought as a slave to be put in Potiphar's house, that doesn't seem like a spur until we know that his wife, Potiphar's wife, spurs him on and has him put in jail with Potiphar. Man in jail, he tells these, uh, the baker and the, the uh, cupbearer, the two chiefs of uh, the uh, Pharaoh's uh, court. Man, he tells them their dreams, and the uh, baker gets executed. The cupbearer goes to be free, and Joseph says, hey, remember me to the Pharaoh. Well, two years later is when that happens, but talk about a lot of spurs. He's been spurred on to help me run that race because God was building a character. God was building the man, the boy, into a man to be the leader of a people, not just the leader in Egypt. That was just a sidebar. That wasn't the main purpose. The purpose that Joseph was there for was to protect his people, his father's people, then which becomes 4, 000, or 4 million people, whatever, uh, when they finally leave in the Exodus 400 years later. That whole purpose, God had a plan. He was working a plan. Now, Joseph didn't see the whole thing, but he had faith. We don't always see God's whole plan. Man, some of us have gone through some heavy-duty trials in our lives. Man, you don't know what the outcome is. You're on the front side of the desert, and you're facing all these things, and, and all you can do is have your hope in God. And, and that's what we see in this song. I know my tears will turn to, to joy. Why? Because I have faith. I have faith that God is working out a plan that he's the master workman who hasn't completed it yet, and it won't be completed until I'm in, with him in heaven. My hope is to be with my Lord, to know as I am known, to serve him gladly all my days, to praise before his throne. Man, I want you to think about that as you look at the life of Joseph, because you could fit those words into the life of Joseph. Man, his, his hope was God, to know him, to serve him gladly, and that's exactly what Joseph did in probably some of the worst circumstances that most people have faced, he continued to serve God gladly. And there's a lesson for us. You know, I ask often, how's your joy meter? And you know what that is, don't you? you know, it, it, gas meter in our car, and it goes from empty to full, and full to empty. And if some of you have been riding on empty way too long. Man, we've got to have the joy of the Lord in our lives. That's what keeps us going on. If you don't have that joy, you know what? We just start getting miserable and down in the dumps, and it's hard to look up. Joseph never got that place. And I think it's an incredible story. I think as you look at his life, know the things, it's kind of like Job. Man, except Job got on the cranky side. Of course, he had friends to help him get there. <laughs> uh, Joseph doesn't get that way. There's nothing negative really said about Joseph in, in all the biblical accounts. So we continue today. We're going to be covering chapters 43 and 44. Uh, looking at Jacob's nine sons, the, the nine sons have gone back home. Simeon was left behind. He's in, in jail, probably in a cell in Joseph's house, in the lower part of that house. And uh, he was left there as surety that the brothers would come back. Well, they had to come back anyway. Joseph knew that. There's famine in the whole world at that time. They don't have enough food. That's why they were there in the first place. They're going to take some food back. It's not going to last very long. So they would be back. But he kept Simeon there to encourage them and, and, and following through. To have uh, They go back home and they explain their father, uh, Jacob, that the viceroy of that's Joseph, second in command of all of Egypt. Here a Hebrew, a, a slave, a young boy, when he gets taken in, a 17-year-old, and he's been a slave, he's been in jail, and yeah, not, not a lot of good stuff. And here he is, the viceroy of all of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh. 
And he requires of them to bring their younger brother, Benjamin. They said they had a younger brother. Boy, bring him here. Joseph knew who they were all along. He recognized them. They didn't recognize him. He's clean shaven, possibly bald at that time. From they, Normally the Egyptians shaved their head. Dressed up in the finery of Egypt, speaking Egyptian. And it was 20 years later. They, they really didn't have a clue at all. Genesis 42. It'd be uh, up on the wall here, or you could turn there a page over in your Bible, 42 verses 36 and 38. You have bereaved me. This is Jacob speaking, the father. They've told him uh, what the, the viceroy wants, and he says, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you take Benjamin. All this has come against me. My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to shield to death. And then in verses 43, 1 through 7, we see the famine has continued on. It hasn't stopped. It's not over. Remember, it was be seven years, and this is probably in that first year. Uh, and it's gotten worse in Cana. And the supplies from the first journey of Egypt, man, they're just about depleted. And unknown to Jacob, and and this is a really key thing to put in your mind. Unknown to Jacob, God was using these trials and the famine to move them towards blessing. Now, I want you to get that. God was moving them toward blessing. You see, we have trials and tribulations in our life. We don't see the end result of that. But God has got a plan. And if God is perfect, and he is sovereign, and he is uh, loving to his children and wants the best for us, then he's working out a good plan in our lives. So if we would hold on to that, that even trials, be it famine, whatever, God is moving us towards blessing and towards the treasure of reconciliation. This is a family divided. Can't begin to tell you how many families in this country is, is uh, not reconciled, is, is split up and divided. And he's moving them towards reconciliation, towards forgiveness, towards peace, and towards joy. Now, that's blessing. Man, I I wish every family had that. Because it surely would be a blessing, not only to them, but to the people around them. Because you know how it is, how we have a tendency to to spread our our dislike? And we do that pretty easily, don't we? Man, if we have a long face on all the time, before you know it, the people around us, they got the long face on too. They don't even know why sometimes, but it's just because these people around me are down in the dumps and, and everything uh, they're complaining about, and that spreads. It's so easy to spread discontentment and much harder to spread contentment. And, and so this is what God's moving them for, and that's the point that we should remember well when we go through various trials. We remember it's God working and moving us towards blessing. Jacob instructs his sons now to go uh, down to Egypt for more provisions. They're just about out of food. Uh, Judah lovingly and firmly confronts his father, because his father doesn't want his son to go, and he stresses to him that Benjamin must go. If he doesn't go, we're not going to go, because the viceroy said, bring your youngest brother. Judah has now moved up position in the family. Reuben, who is the oldest, he, he, he knocked himself out of that position by his immorality with his father's wife. And so his father doesn't trust him, doesn't see him as a leader. He's moved from the heir down to what would be, uh, we would say, the last place of the family. And then 43 verses 18, Judah begins to persuade his father. And he makes uh, this persuasive speech to him. And Jacob realizes that if Benjamin does not go, think about that. What will happen to the family? If Benjamin does go, the family is going to starve. There will be no provisions. And, J- and Benjamin will starve as well. So what he's trying to prevent is going to happen anyway, except it's probably going to happen in a worse way. So Judah makes himself personally responsible. Man, I will take responsibility, you know, and everything will be on my head. He's accountable for Jacob. And think about that. Instead of being selfish, and instead of being selfish as before, because before he was that, now he's showing concern for others. You know what that says? He's growing. He's growing and maturing in the Lord. And so he takes responsibility, and we see this change. 
Jacob's persuaded. He instructs the son to take food uh, that wasn't common in Egypt. They still had food, and so he instructs him in the passage to take some of the honey and, and I think it's almonds from the land and take that down and take double the amount of money. Why double? Well, it, Joseph had sent the money back. They weren't sure how it got in the bags. And to show them that we are indeed men of integrity, that's what they had claimed, and that's what Joseph was testing because these, these ten brothers did not have much integrity before. As they beat up Joseph, threw him in the pit, sold him into slavery, lied to their father and saying a wild animal had killed him and it had eaten him, uh, they, they had not had much. So the gift that he's sending, and it's appropriate in those days to send a gift. We do that today, too, to send gifts along with the, to the president or ambassadors, whatever. So they're going to take these gifts down there. And Jacob knew that the reputation for honesty was worth far more than the money that he could save by compromise. So take all that with you. And he demonstrates the integrity by instructing his sons to take double that back. Jacob had finally come. Think about this. He had finally come to the point of letting go of Benjamin. If he's letting go of Benjamin, who's in control? He's got to be letting God be in control. And that's where God's at all the time. But he's waiting for us to make that step forward, to surrender. We do, we do sing that sometimes, don't we? I surrender all. And that's exactly what's going on here. Jacob's having to surrender all. He's having to surrender that which is most important to him. It used to be Joseph. Joseph's gone, and now it's Benjamin, Joseph's full brother, the youngest son by Rachel, his white, beloved wife, and he's having to let it go. And that's where we find true peace. That's where we find true peace. It's when we let go and let God. Let go and let God. Our fretting will flee if we'll follow the Lord and trust him. And that's what Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You know, about prayer, and don't be anxious for nothing by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And what comes back? And the peace of God which passes understanding will keep your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. That's the letting go. And the focusing, verse 8 and 9 says, to focus on the things of love. Boy, that's God's direction for joy in our lives. So pick up chapter 43. Let's stand and read 15 through 25, chapter 43 of Genesis, 15 through 25. So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them, and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. The men, man did, did as Joseph had told him and brought the men into Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, It's because of the money which was in our sacks the first time that we are to be brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us and make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, O oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food, and when we had come to, came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sacks. Uh, money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought the other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks. He replied, Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought, brought Simeon out to them, and the men uh, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they washed their feet. And when they had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the presents for Joseph at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread with him. Father, continue to guide us uh, in your word and, and teach us from the life of Joseph. Lord, uh, a man that was gracious, a, a man that served you through various trials, and, Lord, bringing his brothers to that place of healing. 
I pray, Father, you would take your word and and, uh, put it into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So they're back in Egypt. Upon the revival, the uh, arrival, the brothers present themselves to the viceroy, still not knowing that he's Joseph, still don't have a clue. Verse 16, he sees Benjamin with them, and then gave, and at that point he gives the instructions to the steward. It was when he seen Benjamin, because that was the big thing. They were to bring him down. Now, not sure he knew what Benjamin would have looked like, maybe he's seen some of himself in him but we'll read more. Uh, So the man takes him in the house, slaughters an animal, man preparing a meal for them. They're going to eat the noon meal with Joseph. Uh, Whether Joseph had made this plan in advance or uh, is unstated, but surely he must have thought about what he would do when his brothers returned. And then we find the fear of uh, fear to cautious relief in, in verse 18 through 25. Man, they imagined that they were brought to the house that boy Joseph was going to assault them, that he was going to take everything they had. I, I think essentially it says, and take their donkeys. Donkeys, man, that was a sign of wealth in, in those days. That was more important than having camels. And so, boy, to take your donkey, that was to them, that would have been the ultimate. They had nothing left. And then in 19 through 22, the brothers are out of fear. They attempt to convince the steward of the household that they had not stolen the payment for the grain that they had received. Uh, and take note of verse 23. I think 23 just jumps right off the page. Look what it says there. This is the steward speaking. This is an Egyptian speaking to the brothers. And look what he says. Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father. How in the world does he know that? Yeah, think about that for a moment. Where where would he have come up with saying that kind of a statement to them? Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks. I received your money. And from the steward, it would seem that Joseph had been sharing his background and his belief in God. You see, all the things he had been through, man, what was on his mind? And we wonder, you know, well, he took an Egyptian wife. Well, you know, uh, look at what he probably did. He, his sons are, have Hebrew names. So we have the impression that he was sharing his faith even when he was down there, even in, in jail and everything else. He kept giving God the glory. Kept giving God the glory. God's the one that interpret dreams. This, that's a big thing. What we need to do is give God glory. When Gloria and I went to lunch the other day, and we were at Olive Garden, and as my try to make it a habit all time to ask the, the waiters or waitresses, the people, if I could pray for them. And she took a step backwards. It was the most amazing thing. She had never, never, she said, I've never had anybody ask me that before. I've never had anybody ask to pray for me. And man, my mind is reeling at that point. You know what? what I wonder what she learned at home. Not much. And then she said, oh yeah, she believed in higher powers in the cosmos. You know, the sound of one hand clapping. and uh, She believed in all sorts of other things, but she did not have faith in God. And Gloria and I just had a few minutes to share with her. Well, she waited on us. Every time she came back, she had a big smile on her face, she kept asking how we were doing. It would seem that that's how Joseph was living his life. And he was not trying to hide God. He's a Hebrew, and he looks Egyptian, but but from that conversation with the brothers, with the housekeeper, or, or the head of the house there, we would imagine that he had to be sharing. And <clears throat> the return of the money was to be regarded as a divine gift. That's what he's telling them. That return of the money, that's divine. Your God has done that. Isn't that crazy? Uh, it, it takes me back, and it just reminds me how much more I can find ways of witnessing about my God to the people around me. How many ways? It's innumerable. Live a life, say a prayer, point out, hey, wow, that, a, a miracle of God. Look what God has done. The point being that God had been working through human agents. That's the point there. And, and what was true then is still true today, that God is working through human agents. God's working through people around us. I, I've said this before. I, I got into uh, counseling, uh, being a, a therapist, a social work therapist, through an atheist who when I was in the military, you're not allowed to play with the people uh, or bring up religious subjects. And she said, hey, Chris, why do you have such a hard time with that? I don't even believe in God. I'm an atheist. And I always ask them if they pray, if they have a higher power. And 
atheist God used to free me up, and I got to share with everybody all the time after that. Man, I prayed with people in, in the therapy office at the base, and most people that would be unheard of. But you know what? God opened the door. As further evidence that they were not being threatened, the steward brings Simeon to them, and verse 24 continues to relieve their stress. May he give them water, washing the feet, and then taking care of the donkeys, making sure that they're fed. All of this was further evidence of grace and generosity of Joseph. Further evidence. He did not hold malice in his heart. He was being gracious, and uh, he was doing the things that God had led him. And still wanting to assure them uh, of, of avoiding Joseph's wrath, that they're still stuck. And we'll find that after their dad dies, they're still stuck. They're still worried that Joseph's going to get even with them. They had a long ways to go before they could have been true healing in this family, but it's on the way. Verse 26, they prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon. Uh, that refusal or inability to accept grace continued to characterize a part of their life. You ever say thank you to somebody or, or tell them how much you appreciate them and they have a hard time accepting it? I'm not sure why we're that way. Man, just say thanks. I appreciate that. And we says, thank you. They tell you you did a good job. Thank you. It's real pretty simple. Just thank you. I don't have to loud in it and, and try to bask myself in the revelry of, man, how great I am. Just a simple thank you of what God's doing in your life. And then we have the feast in verse 26 and 34. When they presented their gifts to Joseph, uh, they bowed down before him to the ground. It's a second fulfillment of his dream where they bowed down before him uh, from Genesis 37. And uh, in verse 27, Joseph begins to ask them questions. Man, you know, that's just talking to them, relieving the tension that they still had. And he, he asked questions about their father. He's showing concern, concern for their families. Joseph then looked upon uh, Benjamin in verse 29, who was his full brother, and he pronounces that blessing upon him by stating, God, be gracious to you, my son. An incredible blessing. And look what happens after that. It proved too much for him, and in verse 30, he heard uh, for his compassion, his mercy, his emotions, they were overwhelming him. Man, he hadn't seen this younger brother who was probably really young, maybe only a toddler when he was uh, sold into slavery, and it's his only full brother, he had not seen him for some 20 years. And and now he's standing there before him. His compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chambers, and he wept there. Man, you see the heart of Joseph, how much he loved and cared. Benjamin... Uh, you know, is now, what, maybe 20 years old by this time or so. Uh, Joseph had uh, been in Egypt approximately 22 years. Uh, so he's probably in his mid-20s. And Joseph, he had not seen him. And I think that's why he asked, is this your youngest brother? Now, he's wanting to make sure, putting them on the spot. Is this your youngest brother, the one that you told me about? And then jo Joseph threw lavish banquet for them. Uh, but the brothers were, were fed at separate tables because for the Egyptian, it would have been a detestable thing to eat with the Hebrews or, or with other people. Uh, Joseph, uh, of course, not Egyptian, but he has been totally accepted in the Egyptian society and is the viceroy of the country. To the amazement of the brothers, another one of them things that stands out. Man, Joseph seats them in order of age. Now, how in the world does he know that? They don't have a clue. They are not getting the picture here. They have no idea. They never expected ever to see Joseph again. As far as they believe, he was probably a slave in some uh, obscure home, or else he was dead. But, man, he puts them in order. Uh, and then, he, not only generous to them, he gives Joseph, or, or Benjamin, five times the amount of food that he gives the other brothers. I, and I see two things at work in that. Joseph had not never had a chance to show Benjamin his love and, and, and his concern since he was so young, and, and now he takes that opportunity to do it. That'd be one possibility. And the other is, man, it's an opportunity once again to test the brothers. And, and how's the test? Well, he's the father's favorite now, and, and so 
He's showing favoritism to Benjamin by giving him five times the amount that the other brothers were getting, uh, and checking to see treat him the way they treated me, and happily, they don't. Again, we see growth in their lives. Some good things that happened that day. Uh, they'll be up on the wall. There was a show of responsibility, as the brothers promised, uh, to take blame for any trouble that may have happened. There was honesty as they acknowledged their culpability and made restitution for the money that was in their sacks. They retrieved their brother from the prison in Egypt, Hence, there's unity in that part of the family. Their display of belief by recognizing that God is at work in their midst, things that they haven't been recognizing really before that. And then the gratitude shown when they rejoiced in their provisions, even when Benjamin gets so much more than what they get. But yet there's a final testing that's going to come in Genesis chapter 44. Turn there. Genesis 44. Verse 1, then he commanded the steward of the house, fill their sacks. So now they're going to head back, giving them grain, sending them back home. And here comes the final test. As much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of the sack and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the younger with his money for the grain. And he did, as Joseph told him, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They, they had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, follow up after them, and when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid, repaid evil for good? Is it not from this uh, that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? What you have, or you have done evil in doing this. When he overtook them, he spoke these, wor these words and said to them, Why does my Lord seek such words, speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouth of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Cana. How then could we steal silver or gold from my Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servants." He said, let it be as you say, this is the word speaking, he who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his back sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack, and he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending up with the youngest, and the cup was found in Joseph's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and every man uh, loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. <clears throat> so we see Joseph having their sacks filled with the grain and, and, and putting the money back in, uh, the payment they received for the first time, and, and gives them that. And he puts the silver cup in Benjamin's sack, instructs the servant, and he's preparing a test, he's testing their character. Uh, what are they going to do? Will they sacrifice the younger brother? Uh, will they uh, defend him? What is going to be the outcome of this? Verses 3 through 5 uh, Soon as morning comes, uh, he tells they leave, tells the servant to follow after them, and look at their defense in six through nine. When confronted, the brothers sought to assure the servant that stealing was never their practice. And, and if the stolen cup would be found in their possessions, verse nine, which of your servants is found with it shall die. Man, not having a clue, not having a clue that the cup was really there, and certainly not having a clue that it was going to be in Benjamin. What would be the ramifications of that? Man, Jacob had already said that he would die if there anything happened to Jacob uh, or to Benjamin. So we got all sorts of things that are building up here. Uh, and, and this is how uh, certain that they were, that they were innocent. Man, they're certain. Man, you kill the one that's got it. First of uh, was conducted. The servant agreed uh, to that procedure, except notice the change in verse 10. Man, that they would be Joseph's servant, they said before, but in verse 10, he says, let it be at you, as you say, he who is found with it shall be my servant. Man, he, he's put a twist in there. there that person is going to have to serve him. He's not even worthy to serve Joseph. 
uh, and the rest of you shall be innocent. The cups found in verses 12 and 13, uh, starting with the oldest, and it proceeds to the youngest, and there the cup is in Benjamin. And notice, there's no mention of the silver. There's no mention of the money that was put back in the sacks, only the cup. Now, maybe that should have sparked a question in their mind, but it doesn't. And we wonder why that was never the issue. And, and they might have realized something was up here, but they still don't. Uh, the, the cup was the focus, and the steward knew, of course, that the cup was Joseph, uh, Benjamin's. And the sudden threat to Benjamin, man, that would have been like a sword in those brothers' hearts. Man, it would have pierced their hearts. All the conditions were present for another betrayal when Benjamin was accused. And yet this time, notice the response is so much different than the response they had with Joseph. Uh, And and we see that the testing, the chastening, everything that Joseph had been doing has been maturing. They are finally taking responsibility for their actions. And isn't that what God is doing in our lives? He tests us so that our character develops to see how we are going to develop his chastening and the trials and tribulations are all to draw us to him, to show that we see our dependence on God and not on the world around us. They're, what do they do? They tear their clothes. In, in Judaism, a sign of grief, a response that they early caused their father to do at the loss of Joseph. Jacob had tore his clothes. And now their response is the same. Rather than sending Benjamin back as they agreed uh, upon the the servant's statement, man, all of the brothers return. Growth again. They all go back and they return to the city. And this time, they would not leave their younger brother, the favorite. Remember, he's the favorite of the father. But they have grown beyond that. Uh, They weren't going to leave him become a slave alone. And then we find the accountability In verses 14 through 34, they found themselves before Joseph a third time. And notice, this time time they threw themselves on the ground in total humiliation, total submission to whatever Joseph would do to them. And then Judah stepped forward as the leader and spokesman of the group uh, while claiming innocence for the, the stolen property. He admits in verse 16 that God had uncovered the servant's guilt. What guilt? They're not guilty of anything. Not there. Do you understand what he's saying? What's what's happening here? Man, they are acknowledged, or Judah at least, is acknowledging the guilt of what they had done to Joseph. That's the only thing they're guilty of. They're not guilty of stealing money. They didn't. Joseph did that. Benjamin really wasn't guilty of taking the cup. And I believe they believed him that somehow the way he got in there. And they recognized, man, that God is working in their lives. How much do we need to have happen to recognize that God is working in our lives? How many times do we stray away like the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Prone to Wander, Lord, I Feel It, Prone to the God of I Love? How often do we do that? And God continues to work, continues to try to bring healing in our lives. And like I said earlier, men, so many families are dysfunctional and divided in this country, even in churches. And God is trying to bring unity. And what does it take? And in Matthew, Jesus says, if you have anger in your heart or somebody has anger towards you, leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and get that relationship right. God thinks so much of our relationships that he says, look, if you're worshiping me and going to sacrifice so we don't kill animals today, but we're going to come and worship in song or worship in prayer. Man, if, there's, if you know somebody's got something against you, they're angry at you, or if you have some issue in your heart, go take care of that first. Realize six of the Ten Commandments are relational other than God. Isn't that crazy? That's how much God thinks of relationship. And yet we see broken families in the churches and all around because we either we're too proud, we're too angry, we've got stuff in our heart that we're not getting rid of. These guys are growing, and I believe that's part of the story for us to see what it takes to grow. It's being honest with who you are, honest with where you're at. I think it's obvious that their conscience must have been bothering them. And, and that's the truth up on the wall. Uh, I remember the first time I heard this verse. It was Gloria's brother said it to his mom. And it was in jest, but your sins will find you out. I mean, there's reality there. 
folks. It's a reality statement. You know, uh, you have sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sins will find you out. And that's what happens here. Their sins find them out. You know, we can hide them to, from each other, can't we? We're pretty good at that. We compartmentalize all the time, keep things in these back closets of our mind that we don't want people to see. God sees it. God knows that it's hurting us. And we, we wonder why we keep coming back. Why does that thing creep up into my mind? Maybe it is because I have not really let go of it. I haven't really forgiven. Only you can decide that. Judah was willing to admit that there was a reason God may have delivered them into, into the bond. He regarded this as divine discipline. Do we see that in our own lives? We, we're so, so willingly and, and easily say the devil did it. The devil's against me. The devil's out to get me. Instead of looking at God's trying to work in our lives. Judah didn't argue on the basis of the arrangement uh, with the steward had declared in verse 10 or on the basis that of what the brothers had declared previously in verse 9. Rather, he suggests that all of them would become Joseph's servants or slaves. In verse 17, Joseph protested to such a penalty, and he demanded only that slavery of the man who uh, had the cup in his, in his bag, uh, and that was Benjamin. Again, we see the brothers being treated with kindness and grace, man, and, and yet not noticing or at least not understanding what's taking place. They, they don't get it. They're, they're not bit to that point of recognition yet. Judah begs Joseph to accept his life in place of Benjamin. Boy, that's different for, for Judah. He reminded Joseph that their father, uh, Jacob, is old and that he would die if anything happened to Benjamin. He admitted that Jacob uh, believed that Joseph had been torn to pieces in verse 28. And now Jacob's life was closely bound with the boy with Benjamin in, in verse uh, 30. And, and <clears throat> then Judah then asked to be a substitute for Benjamin upon my father, uh, or he, he said uh, uh, that he could not stand to see the evil uh, or the misery that would come upon their father. Man, he he's this a guy tenderized by the Lord's discipline, and then that's what discipline's all about: tenderize our heart. Why did God leave them out in the desert for forty years? Is God so unknowing that He didn't know what was in their hearts? When he says I, to, to test their hearts, he already knew what was in them. Man, he's testing them so that they would see what's in their hearts, so that they would turn fully to God. And, and that's exactly what we see taking place here. Benjamin is willing to, to sacrifice himself to spare his father any more sorrow. Judah doesn't try to hide the brother's guilt or blame the actions on anyone else. So different than before. Joseph had tested his brothers by framing Benjamin and allowing the other brothers to be free. And how the other brothers react, you know, it's not stated, but we know what they did in verse 13. They all returned, and then they could say, hey, you're out of here, man. You take him, you know, just like they did to Joseph. They don't do that. They all returned. They're sticking together as a family, defending their younger brother. Judah's intervention on behalf of, uh, on their behalf, showed the great love that he had for his father, and it shows the loyalty that he had to Benjamin. It also demonstrated that the brothers were not willing to repeat the act that they had committed against Joseph so many years before. Uh, they weren't perfect. See, sometimes we think, well, i got to get perfect. man. But Scripture says in, he, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, I'll not be perfect until the perfect comes. I'll not know until he comes, and then I'll fully know as I have been fully known. And so we're not, it's not that we're going to be perfect here. Man, we're on a journey, but it's that we continue to walk forward in that journey, walking in his presence. And they showed repentance and they showed change. And then the, the wrapping this all up. All the brothers were transformed, but none more so than Judah. None more so than Judah. Remember, he is not the oldest. He's about at third in line, fourth in line. Uh, there's Judah, or Reuben, Levi, Simeon, 
and, and then then there comes Judah. So he's the fourth one in line. He's certainly not not in that position to be the leader, but he he becomes the leader. And what's so important about that? Well, here's some things to consider. Judah was the one idea of selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites, right? Yeah, it was his idea. Uh, man, don't don't kill him. We'll sell him to the Ishmaelites, and that's in Genesis 38. But now Judah is willing to be the substitute and to bear the punishment of the accused. A picture of it's a picture of Jesus. Do you see the the, the what we're shown in in Joseph? Man, we see the picture of Jesus here in the Old Testament because Jesus bore our sins and He was our substitute on the cross. Judah demonstrates love for the accused sinner, and he uh, displays love for his father by not wanting his father to be put. To and that again shows us Jesus, who has love for the sinner and who does the Father's will. He is glorifying the Father by everything he does. Jesus did the Lord's will. And then Judah was interceding. Who intercedes for us? It says that Jesus sits at the right hand of power, and what is he doing? He is interceding for us all the time. Again, you see the picture of Jesus and Joseph. And, and Jesus Christ is the Messiah. I am from the tribe of Benjamin, Judah. Why is that? Because we see how Judah is displaying a Christ likeness. This man has totally changed. His behavior has changed. And it changed through the fiery furnace of trials. The brothers had changed through the furnace of trials. And, and yet, sometimes we think we're, we should never have another trial in our life. Trials are there to refine us, to burn off the wood, stubble, and hay, the dross of our lives, that which is not Christ-like. As God would have it, Judah's willingness to suffer as a substitute for his brother foreshadowed the substitutionary and, and uh, victorious atonement of Jesus Christ. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. I think it's incredible when you start looking at the whole picture in Joseph's life. We must never underestimate the transforming grace of God. Just as God was with Joseph and with his brothers, guess what? Man, all, in those silent decades, God is with you. Even when it seems like God is not there, he hasn't left you nor forsaken you. He tells us that. He is still with you. And what's he doing? He is working to do something in our lives that we don't see. And he says he's working all things together for the good. Even in death, God is working good. Now, I'll never forget when uh, James Dobson was still with folks on the family years ago, and five board members were killed in a plane accident, all men that were really renowned men. One was a heart surgeon, and I don't remember what the others were, businessmen. And, you know, and I'll never forget Dobson saying on the radio, you know, what, what could God have done with their lives? And the wife of the surgeon said that she believed God could do more in her husband's death than in his life to touch more people's lives. We don't tend to think that way very much anymore. We've gotten so very self-focused. And what we see, especially through Judah, is the change to become other-focused, to become God-focused, to to look at his brother with compassion. If you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, That same transforming power is in you, and it's available. Isn't that what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says? It's up there on the wall. You can turn there. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creature. New. Think about that. Brand new. Blooming new. Love it. Man, Gloria's got surprise lilies. They, they, you don't know when they're going to come up necessarily. And boy, all of a sudden they're there, and then poof, man, there's this beautiful bloom on that thing. Like, yeah, it happens. Well, you accept Christ as your Savior, man, boom, the Holy Spirit is in you. You have the power to change. Because it's not in you, it's in the Holy Spirit who is in you. The old things have passed away, behold, new things have come. If any man is in Christ, any person, any child, any woman is in Christ, they are. It's not that they might be, it's not that you're becoming, they are a new creation. Brand new. We just got to start walking in the truth of it. And if you have someone that, that you love dearly and they're not walking in the truth of it, boy, that's how you pray. 
You know, there are a lot of people who have accepted Christ in the young age of life or teen years, and man, the world just pulls them and pulls at them. How do I pray for them? I, I believe they know the Lord. Well, believe that they walk in the transforming power of being a new creation. God is working. He hasn't quit. And then the last one is Romans 12, 1 and 2. However many times we have looked at these verses. And they're up on the wall. And this is this is what the new life brings. I, Paul said, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Then he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Man, I am transformed by the Holy Spirit living within me, by the renewal of your mind, by the testing, uh, that by testing you may discern the will of God. By testing, we'll discern the will of God. And what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God? Just as Judah and his brothers came to see God, uh, that God was caring for them, all along, all that way along, so must we. All those trials, we need to look back and look at the hand of God. I've said many times, boy, it's hard to see God when you're on the front side of the desert. It's hard to understand what, the, what God's discipline is all about. Man, you get on the back side of the desert, and you take a look back at your life, and you can see where God has been working. And we need to do that often. So that we remember that God is working in our lives. He hasn't forsaken us. He is there. What's he doing? He, he is working to transform us to be more Christ-like. So I guess the question is, and only you can answer this, how Christ-like are you? How Christ-like are you? Well, how do I judge that? I haven't done any miracles. <laughs> I haven't accosted any Pharisees. How do I do it? I'd better let you think about that for a while. How do I do it? I do it by following his will. I do it by following the Great Commission. I do it by loving one another. I do it by unity to the body and to the family and to the world around me. And you know how we do that? We're never going to legislate it. It will never be legislated. Legislate peace. The world's been trying to legislate peace for how many years? Well, since time. And the world's never done it. Man, we do it by one person at a time. By me loving others. By me being willing to sacrifice self. And that doesn't mean going out and killing myself. But by sacrificing my wants, my ways, my, my will. Sometimes, and... Gosh, I have living proof that you will wind up having to eat crow that you didn't make. You'll wind up having to ask for forgiveness for something you didn't do because the other person's mad or the other person's upset and they haven't been able to. They're not the ones that are going to come. But you know that. If you know somebody has ought against you, go to that person. You. Why should I go? Because God's speaking to you. That's why. And maybe the other persons aren't listening. But if we're ever going to change this world, it's going to be that way. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we come before your throne to ask, Lord, that you would take this uh, account of Joseph, another account of his life. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, that as David said in Psalms 139, that you would search us and try us and see if there is any ungodliness in our lives, if there's any wood, stubble, hay, any dross, uh, anything that's not like Christ. Oh, well, Lord, I, I don't know how we could, uh, we're not perfect, so there's be things in our lives. And Lord, if there is, help us to confess it. Lord, sometimes we're weak to face the things that have been in our lives, some of the hurts, the pains that have developed into anger and bitterness. Lord, help us to face it and help us to do what's necessary to be relieved from it. Glorify yourself, Lord. As John plays, will you take a few moments and 
go before the throne. God invites you to come to the throne that you might receive grace and mercy in your time of need. In your time of need. Will you do that right now? 